Can an amateur fighter with an amateur skill set actually predict when, aka what round, and how, what mechanism, what strike they are going to use to beat an opponent? Can they predict this accurately? Just like Conor McGregor, Mystic Mac, used to say exactly when and what punch he'd use to knock out a specific opponent. And he was right before his number one opponent was himself. And that, if you know what I'm talking about. Muhammad Ali used to call out the round he would beat guys in, and he was right within one or two rounds. Same thing with Floyd Mayweather. These guys all were able to do this. Can an amateur actually do this same thing? Yes. They can not only do it, they can probably do it better than a professional fighter can. And we will explain why. They just need to satisfy very basic criteria that we will get to later in this video. First, we have to give a little bit of a backstory. First things first, how are these guys accurately predicting the fights in the first place? Well, it's not random. It's also not mysticism. It's not like they're arranging tea leaves and going, well, Mercury's in retrograde, so a right uppercut to the jaw. No, that is retarded. It's also not that they're just so dominant that they can decide how and when they want to beat you no matter what. It doesn't matter for them. They just come up with some arbitrary assignment and then follow through. That's not exactly true, though some people seem to think that's what's happening. It's usually that these guys have done their homework. Because there's so much fight footage, past fights, training footage from these guys at the professional level that they can look up things and find out, hey, this guy's got a certain tendency to do X and Y is the way to beat that strategy. Let's use me as an example. I'm predicting I'm going to knock you out in the second round with a left hook. That's usually because I saw that when you come forward in the second round, when you're a little tired, you start dropping this rear guard, which is what protects you from the left hook. So I see that that left check hook is a really good move to use against that. But I also know it's going to take about two rounds to get my timing down and to get you tired enough to really capitalize on that. That's what these guys are doing. Now, if you're in the professionals, you might not have such an obvious glaring mistake that you make. So it might be one step removed from that, meaning that instead of trying to just capitalize on them dropping this right hand, they first have to feint and then make them drop the right hand to go. It's just one more step, but it's the same fundamental process. That's what they're doing. As an amateur, you might not even know your opponent's first name, let alone have a big database of past fight and training history. And even if you did, you found this guy's YouTube and he uploads everything, unless he's uploading current stuff that he's actually employing in the fight against you, it's probably outdated because these guys are learning so quickly that a mistake he made six months ago might not be applicable anymore because he's only had a year of experience. That's half of his experience. So that's something to consider. Also, if you try to draw inferences from these online ledgers that, say, have um, fighter information, it'll say, like, your height, your weight, your reach, uh, your stance, stuff like that. They're often super inaccurate for amateurs because there's no money in it. It's just guesswork estimations by volunteers. Mine used to say, when I was younger, that I was 280 pounds, I had a 73-inch reach, that I was six foot one, and that I was southpaw. I'm orthodox. I just go into southpaw sometimes. I was about 240. I have a 69 inch reach and I'm 5'9 and a half. So super, super inaccurate statistics. So if you were trying to draw something about that in order to fight me, you'd be making very big mistakes. So how does an amateur that doesn't have access to all this information come up with a strategy to predict how and when they're going to beat somebody? Remember at the beginning, I said we had to satisfy very basic criteria. What that actually is, is that you need to have at least two styles that you're comfortable in, that you can use in concert in a very specific way that I'll explain now. So let's say that in round one, I come out with this stonewall guard, which is very similar to a Philly shell, but instead of the Philly shell, where I'm kind of more back like this, and this arm is anchored, right? See, it doesn't move very much. I'm actually moving it out, right? So the angle of this elbow actually changes, which you might do in the Philly shell also, but traditionally it's a little bit more back like this, right? So this stonewall guard is really good at stifling an offense for at least one round before somebody has some time to think about how to adapt to it or talk to their cornerman, their coach, and say, hey, what the fuck do I do from this? Because if you see that this blocks pretty much everywhere, right? There's no surface area that you have, except maybe here, and I can even swing out of the way. 
If you come up like with a hook, a block there, it can very quickly transfer to the other side. And because of the angle, it's almost like chain mail, right? No matter what angle your strike comes at, it's either going to be deflected or caught up or t totally stuck. I might even pin it with both my elbow and my guard, and then I can come over the top. It's actually a pretty good strategy if you do not know what to do to change up how you approach fighting somebody like that, which is usually going to be the case for somebody in round one who's never seen that before. So they go back to their coach and say, hey, what the hell do I do? Any competent coach will tell you that to beat this, you got to get up close and pressure fight and go to the body because the body is where I'm most open. Let's say I block like a left hook, for example. Look at my body. I can swing this if I have enough shoulder mobility, but still, right? It's got to be timed perfectly. I have a lot of body space open. Plus, if they come forward and tie me up, if they push this hand out of the way, they have this perfect path to get me up in the chin, right? So that's how they should fight that fight. However, because I have two different styles that I'm going to use in concert in round two, I'm not going to be there for this. I'm going to be in peekaboo now because what does peekaboo want? It wants to get close to somebody. So if he's going to try to get close for me, he's done his, my job for me. How often is Mike Tyson trying to come forward in order to pressure fight? What if the guy does that for you because that's what he thinks he's supposed to do against what you've shown him? That's a brilliant situation because now he's going to do some kind of uppercut. I'm going to come down, block it, and I'm going to come up in that same position and it's over for him, right? So from there, it's not really the biggest leap to say, I'm going to get this guy in the second round. And the way I'm going to do it is by having this guy overextend and I'm going to catch him with one of these powerful close range shots, because that's the situation that I've actually manufactured for myself using this strategy. However, Sometimes this fighter is going to adapt before the end of the first round because, of course, he's not a total idiot. He can see that something isn't working for a minute and a half and change, or his corner's going to be yelling him instructions. So what do you do then? Well, that's why you need to be able to switch between these styles fluently within one round, not just one round, then the second round, you change it up. You have to be able to go from one to the other with fluid movements for this reason. Because whether it's in the first round that you see this opportunity, you're gonna take it. You're not gonna just wait for the second round just because you're married to the idea of impressing everybody with your prediction. Sure, that's cool, but that's kind of the problem that Israel Adesanya faced with Sean Strickland. He was more concerned about what color he's gonna paint his nails for his movie moment at the end of the fight where he speaks into the camera and delivers some cringy line. He wasn't really taking him serious. You have to be a little bit more pliable, a little bit more malleable, a little bit more open to changing things than what you decide. But it is okay to have a general strategy. Having a skeleton is good. But if it's in the first round, that's fine. It might also be in the third round because maybe it goes past the second round and now this guy is so confused that he's trying all different stuff. And sometimes this is going to be what you want to use against him. Sometimes this. It depends on his range, which is why it's good to have this specific matchup because one is kind of close range or pressure fighting to get to close range and another is kind of long range. One is defensive, one is offensive, right? So it's good in that these kind of interact with very common general styles that your opponent might employ. So you get away with kind of everything. But you can't just mash any two styles together that you want without thinking about how these two styles actually interact. Because even the order you place them in happens to matter. If in round one we do peekaboo instead of round two, and then in round two we do the stonewall guard, that's actually a bit of a problem for us. Because although we're going to confuse our opponent a bit, which is not valueless, the problem is the way his coaches should tell him to deal with that pressure fighting, forward walking, peekaboo style is to stay long, jab out. Maybe because the guard is flush to my skin, he can put his guard out to trap this hand and then strike at the very last second. He also wants to stay long to avoid these forward shifts, right? The D'Amato shifts that are so famous. You have to stay long for that. But the way that that interacts with this Stonewall guard is actually also not so bad for him. It's not optimal, but it's not bad because while the defense part of the Stonewall guard kind of works with everybody, it's a very generalist style of defense. It's good for self-defense in that way. Like if somebody's swinging punches at me, I'm doing this 
because that's the biggest surface area. It's very easy depending on what angle they're at. But the offense part of it is all tied to that defense. It's a counterpunching type of style. And it relies on somebody who's trying to get in, right? Especially at kind of a mid range with you. So if you're fighting somebody who's out fighting you while you're trying to do something that's also kind of an out fighting style, that's a problem, right? It's neutralized at best. Plus, because you just taught this guy to tie up your guard against your skin, well, if he does that against me like this, he's going to knock that out of the way and uppercut or come forward. That also works, that in and out type of style. So it matches actually pretty well against that style. You got to consider these things. Now, what are the styles that you should actually learn in order to have these good matchups? The biggest return on investment would probably be from one of the two following. Number one would be learn how to be both in Southpaw and in Orthodox. Because now, no matter what type of opponent you're facing, you can decide whether it's open stance or closed stance, which allows you all this great strategy and ways to set up your opponent in round one for round two, like we just said. The other one is have a pressure fighting style that's good for close range and a long guard style, whether it's this stone wall or just like a classic long guard, whatever, have one that is both close range and long range because these interact with each other well as well for building upon this round one to be round two type of strategy.